Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Lord, I'm so happy to be in the house of the Lord with these crazy people. It's raining out. I mean, like, Lord, it is pouring. I mean, Lord, it is like when I drove up, it was like flooded freeway. And here these people are to worship you and praise you and hear your word. These people, Lord, are very, very, very special. And they are trying to say that they love you more than their own comfort, Lord. And they've come into the house of God to bless you, and may it be a blessing to you as we live up a sacrifice, or offer up a sacrifice of praise to you because of who you are and what you've done for us. And we're a grateful people. So bless us this night, Lord. We'll give you the praise as the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit teaches us. And Lord, we just give you praise, give you glory, give you honor. Thank you so much. Bless all the churches that are meeting and preaching and teaching the the uncompromised, unconditional word of the Lord, we bless them as the gospel goes forth. May it be the power that ignites a city. In Jesus' mighty name. We're all in agreement with a great big amen. We say amen. amen. Tonight, I forgot the title of the message. I think it's called, Let's Just Talk Jesus. I think that's a pretty good subject. And I was, you know, just meditating the Word of God, reading the Word, and thinking about a lot of things in the Bible, you know, and I, I see this and I see that, and I, and I just started to read. I happened to be in Genesis, and I was just thrilled reading something that was so important. Last Sunday night, we talked about the problem in your marriage, if there is a problem. It's not a marriage problem. It's not a husband problem. It's not a wife problem just really isn't. It's a reverence problem. I know that sounds strange, but that's the way it is. And I was thinking about, and you can check it out for yourself, a young man by the name of Joseph. And you can look it up in the 39th chapter, verse number 9. Potiphar's wife, Joseph sold off into slavery, as you know. I mean, he's got to be miserable. His family's rejected him. His brothers wanted to kill him, but they decided not to kill him. They sold him off to slavery. And when he gets to this place called Egypt, he becomes a slave to a great man by the name of Potiphar. Potiphar is one of the right-hand men of Pharaoh himself and a genius in his own right and very wealthy. And uh, he becomes a common slave. And in the house, he's a really handsome young man. And um, there's a cougar in the house, <laughs> Potiphar's wife. <laughs> and she likes this young guy, you know? He's good looking. And she goes after him, and a couple of times she says, come on, let's have sex. She really says, come and lay with me. And um, I, 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 the response of Joseph had to be the most interesting response. I mean, here's this young man, probably, who knows, maybe 20 years old, 22, something like that, full of life, knows he's good looking. I mean, he's got misery ahead of him and around him because he's in slavery now where he used to be free. And all of a sudden, it's not like, you know, you have lots of girls chasing you around at some local bar or anything. I mean, he's just like any other man. If you're a man in here, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, so here comes Potiphar's wife that's probably not very bad looking at all, wanting to hustle him. And he says something that probably changed his entire life. He says these words. Why would I do such an evil thing? and sin before my God, or against my God. In other words, his reverence for God was greater 
than his own feelings and most likely greater than his own desires. I, I just was so impressed by that. From that point on, you'll just see him soar. Things happen, yes, got problems, trials. Things don't happen immediately. Sometimes we as Christians, you know, we, we don't get answers right away about things. And it's really kind of frustrating. And, and the thing that I noticed about him is that he says, why would I sin? Not against myself or against you or against my employer who has been good to me, Potiphar. But I, I would sin against my God. In other words, God was more important than even his own feelings or maybe even his own deep desires like most men. I saw that when I pulled into the parking lot tonight and I saw your cars and I saw the rain. You know, I, I didn't even wear a jacket. I got out of the car from where I was. I didn't have to go across the parking lot. I have a nice little parking spot. You know, I go like 10 feet. I got soaked in 10 feet. And I thought about you. You could have been anywhere tonight and you're here. And that's the same kind of heartbeat that says, you know, it's not about my comfort, it's not about my rest, it's not about what I think is good or bad or what I want. It's about what God wants for me. And tonight, I'm going to church, I'm going to sing songs, I'm going to listen to the word of God. God's going to touch me, I'm going to touch God tonight. And that's where reference comes in. And like I said about marriage, marriage, your problem is not your wife or your husband. Your problem is your reverence level with the things of God. You'll find out more about that on Sunday. It's kind of cool. Go with me, if you will, Matthew 9, chapter. I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about the Word of God. We're going Matthew, last verse, the ninth chapter, and then right into the 10th chapter, which is really quite an interesting chapter. All of them are interesting, but we're going to look at the words of Jesus. So when I say, let's just talk Jesus, that's what we're going to do for a while. Is that all right? Then I'll let you go. It's kind of like, if you will, a little home Bible study. You just need a little fireplace. And so I know that if you listen, God's going to speak to you about yourself tonight. Jesus is with his disciples. He's getting them to pray, you know, and he says... The harvest is truly plentiful and the laborers are few at verse 38. In verse 39, he makes a statement. He says, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. In other words, he's asking his disciples to do something that they are going to pray about. He acknowledges there's a shortage. He acknowledges there's a need. And then he says to his disciples, I want you to pray about it. You say, well, what's so strange about that? I think what's really neat about that is that the 10th chapter comes along, or the very next verse, and they themselves answer the prayer. Today I was shopping, and it started to rain when I got out of my car. And it was just a little bit of rain. I ran into the grocery store. I had to do some big shopping because we hadn't been in the store in a long time. Man, whew. as I ran into the grocery store, I prayed. I said, God, man, I, I want to be happy when I come out. I don't want to be wet. So what I'm asking for is that maybe a cloud blow away. Has anybody ever done that? Just as I come out of the store and it'll be dry. The same thing that you do when you go into a parking lot. You say, Lord, I need a parking place. Have you ever noticed sometimes you get them? And then sometimes you don't? <laughs> don't tell me you get them all the time. So I shop, you know, and I got all my stuff. I got like tons of stuff. Like pushing the cart out the door. And I looked outside. Man, it was pouring. <laughs> and I said, thanks a lot, Lord. He says, well... You want to be happy? Don't be happy because it's raining or not raining. Be happy because I'm God. Amen. And I just said, okay, I'm going to praise you anyway as I got soaked. <laughs> Sometimes you yourself are the answers to the prayers that you pray. And that's what this is really all about. There's something you need, 
and the answer that you need is going to come from you and what you do. And that's what happens with the disciples. He says, pray for the harvest. We need laborers. And they probably prayed, oh God, send somebody. In the next chapter, next verse, he sends them. Let's take a look at the 10th chapter, verse number 1. It says, and when he had called his disciples, stop right there. Here's Jesus calling not anybody. If you're an anybody, you're not going to make it. You're not going to hear from God. He's going to tell you what to do. You're not going to get the job done. You're not going to have the inside track. You're never going to be there. You can't be just anybody. You're going to have to be somebody that's a disciplined learner. That's what the disciple means. I'm going to learn your ways. And like the song we sang, I'm going to follow you. And Jesus doesn't call just anybody to himself. He calls those people that are willing to follow and listen and learn. And then he talks to them. And that's what you are tonight. You're somebody that didn't get turned back by the weather, didn't get turned back by the rain. Some of you didn't have dinner tonight, but you got here anyway. Let me tell you something. You may be hungry, but God noticed it. And you can never outdo that. And that's what I try to explain to the church. The things you do says about who you really are. And God makes this incredible statement. He says, I call, I don't call just anybody. I call those who are willing to follow me that'll get out of themselves. You can't follow God unless you're ready to get out of the way and let him be the leader. And he's looking for disciples today that'll follow him. And when you are, you're someone he'll call and he'll speak to. Trust me. In fact, he'll speak so much to you, make you wild. He says, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power. I, I love that verse. He empowered them. He gave them power. If I, if I was to ever empower Deborah, I'd just have to give her a credit card. <laughs> she already has all the credit cards anyway. It's actually the other way around. She empowered me by giving me the credit card. And so it's different, but with God, he's the one, he's the source of power. Stop just there and think for a moment. You and I are going to always try to do stuff ourselves. I don't know how to change the world. I don't know how to change anybody. I don't know how to get one job done. If you want to know the truth, in my own power, I can go so far. But I need God to come in and empowerize me because he takes a nobody and makes them a somebody because they are people that follow him and he gives them the power. Now, you nobodies that are out there, with the power of God, you become a somebody. And he empowers them. I love that. He didn't just say a pat you on the back, I'm encouraging you. But he actually empowers them with something that changes the world that they're in. They're going to do something for him. And by the way, you're going to do something for him with your life. And when you do, you've got to remember it's not your power that's going to get the job done. If it's your power that gets the job done, then all of a sudden you can only go so far. But when you have his power, how far is it that you can go? There's no limits. And so we have oftentimes stopped and don't realize that God, when he calls us, wants to empower us. To live the life, to be the witness, to walk the walk, to talk the talk, to carry the weight. To be the example to a lost and dying world, that's our God. You say, I can't do that. No, you can't. That's no doubt about it. None of us can. But that's where the empowering of God makes the difference. I like when it says, hold your finger right there in the 10th chapter of Matthew and go with me, if you will, into Romans, the 16th chapter, which happens to be the last verse, last chapter in Romans. In Romans... The 16th chapter, let's take a look at this, so important for us to see. Verse number 25. It says, now Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he makes this statement, now to him who is able, I love the word able. I should have highlighted the word him, words that are him who is able. Is that a possibility, you guys, back there? The words now to him who is able. That's God. He empowers his people. 
I don't know how I'm going to make it. You don't know how you're going to make it. I don't know how you're going to accomplish anything. I don't know how I'm going to accomplish anything. I, I, if I have to get in this pulpit area and do what a great pastor has to do, I don't have the power to do that. I can't do it. I'm going to make excuses. Uh, there's all kinds of frailties I have, all kinds of uh, failures in my past and in my life. I cannot do it. But with the power of God, I can. He who is able, and because he's able, listen to this, to empower you to get the job done, whatever it is you're facing in your business and your marriage and with your trials and tribulations, how you're going to accomplish in your schooling, whatever it is, whatever, ever, ever, there's no in limits to whatever it is, whatever it is that you can believe God for, my Bible says there's nothing impossible to him that believes. Therefore, in order for you to understand how to get the power, you're going to have to understand that God is able to do something, and I love this word, establish. You can't establish yourself. I can't establish myself. But the word establish is a great word. It means to stand strong, to be there continuously, to make you a living memorial monument for God. You don't know how you're ever going to get there, but if you believe in the power of God that's going to help you get there to do the job that you need to do that you cannot do. So here's his disciples, they have no idea. By the way, the 10th chapter of Matthew is the first missionary journey you'll ever see in the scripture. This is the first time he's ever sent his boys out. And you can learn a lot from the very first time something takes place in the Bible. And he says these words, I'll empower them, I'll be able to establish, and you, I'll, listen to this, I'll establish you according. See the word according up there? It means in like manner of. I'll establish you in likeness of my gospel, good news, and the preaching of Jesus Christ. In other words, I will establish you according to what my word has to say. I don't know if you were here Sunday morning a couple of weeks ago, but Pastor Dan taught on covenant. That's where God makes a promise and he backs it with himself. And when God makes a promise, backs it with himself, all of a sudden the word of God becomes alive and most powerful because now becomes eternal. So God says he wants to establish you according to what his word has to say. Are you following this? And then he says, according to the revelation and the mystery kept secret since the world began. Did you know that the world couldn't figure it out? All the angels of heaven had no idea what the plan of God was. It was a complete mystery. Nobody knew what was going on. I thought that was kind of fascinating, that God had some great plan that nobody, he didn't let anybody know what the plan was, but now everybody knows what the plan is. Look at the next verse. But now made manifest, what, the plan, that great mystery. And now it's made manifest, God has now made it aware for every one of us by the prophetic scriptures, made known to all nations. Let me tell you something, God's there telling everybody. And the word of God goes forth. And why is it so important? Because you've been established according to the gospel or the word of God. And this mystery that used to be a mystery is no longer a mystery. Now the mystery is now you being empowered by God. <laughs> what for? According to the commandment of the everlasting God. What for? For obedience to the faith. So you can keep this going. God's looking for somebody who established, he'll powerize you. He'll take you from a nothing to a somebody. He'll, he'll do the work for you if you'll just reverence and respect him and understand that he's going to establish you because he is able to do that. But he'll only establish you according to his word, which is backed by his promise, which is in the eternal word of God. And then he comes along, he says, that was a mystery to the world, but now it's been made known to everybody. And he says, he wants this, he says that you might establish, listen to this, by obedience to the faith. In other words, you need to walk in the obedience of what you heard. And then the power of God follows your obedience. So for an example, here's Jesus. He's talking to his disciples. Think about it for a moment. He says, I'm going to send you out. I'm going to empower you. And he comes along and he tells them how he's going to empower them. And what if they say, forget it, man. I ain't doing that. That's like crazy. Nobody's ever done that. 
Now, I can understand you doing it, Jesus, because we're not quite sure about who you are yet. We're just following you. We haven't quite gotten a whole picture here. That's why he comes along later on and says, who do they say that I am and who do you say that I am? Well, they're trying to figure this all out. And here he now puts them on the spot and empowers them. Notice, let's go back to Matthew, the 10th chapter again. Kind of cool, huh? Is anybody listening tonight? Matthew 10 chapter, I've only gotten into verse number one. And when he had called his 12 disciples, he empowered them over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. Oh my goodness. I mean, I can understand if you empower me just to live a good life or to be there as a leader in the congregation or maybe a leader in my city or to sit in judgment over people. You empower me in my job. But now you're talking about something very spiritual, and that's the truth. That you cast out the devils and you can heal the sick and you can uh, heal diseases. Now, the only one that does the healing is the Holy Spirit. So he is empowering them with the Holy Spirit. Now, you've got to get a picture of this. They're not saved yet. No one's gone to the cross. So the Holy Spirit's not going to live on the inside of them. But the Holy Spirit, like David, is going to work with them. You have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, a completely different thing, a completely different level. But they didn't have the Holy Spirit on the inside of them yet. No one gone to the cross and died for them yet. They were still under the covenant of the Old Testament, or the Old Covenant. And you today and I today are a people that are born of the Spirit of God. We now have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Why? Because the Holy Spirit can live on the inside of us. Why? Because God's blood washed us clean. <laughs> and which empowers us, and if they're in being empowered from the Holy Spirit that's assisting them on the outside... <laughs> How much more can the church do uh, uh, when the Holy Spirit lives on the inside? Now let me warn you about the Holy Spirit. You've got to watch yourself. Because it's misunderstood by a lot of people. In fact, hold your place right there. I know we're only in verse number one. But I'd like you to go with me, if you will, in Matthew the 12th chapter. You're there in Matthew the 10th. Just go to Matthew the 12th chapter. And let's look at verse number 22 together. Matthew 12, chapter, verse number 22. And I'm going to read a lot of verses here in Matthew 12, chapter 22, and I'm going to explain them. And I want you to keep in mind that the subject is how you approach the Holy Spirit. In other words, if it's the Holy Spirit he's empowering them with to get the job done, it's going to be the same Holy Spirit that he's empowering you with to get the job done that's set before you. You've got to understand that. And in order to do this, you're going to have to be very sensitive are you listening to me? I'll repeat it. You're going to have to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So here's the Spirit of God starting to work. Let's read verse number 22 of the 12th chapter of Matthew. Then one was brought to him, speaking of Jesus, notice the capital H and the word him, who was demon-possessed, blind, and mute. And he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Wow, is that got to be mind-boggling? And I love this. And, and all of the multitude were amazed. And they said, could this be the son of David? Don't you just love the people? The people come along, they don't have a problem with this. They see a miracle. I mean, they see a guy that's blind. They see a guy that can't speak. And Jesus comes along and heals him, bang, right before their very eyes. And they're ready to accept it. And they think, wow, could this be the son of David? Which means, could it be in the bloodline of the David that the Messiah is coming through? Could this be our Messiah? <laughs> I love people because people are just ready for God. And oftentimes, you and I are ready for God, and then we get screwed up with somebody who's not ready with God. Let me explain what that means. Listen to this next verse. Now, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, oh, here they go. Somebody who's going to screw up what God just did. Some religious thinking person. Someone who's not seeing the spirit, but sees the carnal and natural way of doing things. And figures for themselves they can't do it. And also are walking an amazing amount of pride. 
that somebody could have the anointing, somebody could have the presence, somebody could have the power of the Holy Spirit to take a deaf, um, a, a, a mute man and a, and a person who is, 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 is under this pressure and make him heal and whole, and they couldn't do it. Now watch this, here we go. And then the Pharisees heard this saying, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons, in other words, the devil. <laughs> now here the next verse comes along that says this, but Jesus knew their thoughts. Wait a minute. I want you to know something, and you've got to get a picture of this. Jesus knows your thoughts. The devil does not know your thoughts and cannot read your mind. How do I know that? Because if he could, he would have manufactured in the book of Daniel somebody that was from his soothsaying magicians that would have come along and given insight to Daniel about his wild dream. And they couldn't come up with it. He cannot read your thoughts. You know what the devil does? He reads your face. He reads your emotions. He sees your eyes twitch. He sees your forehead wrinkle. He watches your face. He's watched you all your life. Every expression you know says something from your heart. He knows where you're at. But Jesus comes along, and man, that's the one we need to be wise about. He can read your thoughts. And just like, if you will, Joseph, we ought to be so respectful of God. I'm not going to sin before my God to keep that kind of a thought in my mind. Is anybody listening? And Jesus knows their thoughts, and he says to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to dissolution, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself, and how then will his kingdom stand? In other words, that's pretty obvious. I couldn't be possibly of Satan because he would be fighting against himself doing such things and his kingdom would not stand. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, then who do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. I'm not quite sure what that verse is referring to. I think I have some ideas. But for us tonight, I don't even know that it's that important. Verse 28. But if I cast demons out by the Spirit of God, so if you want to know who's casting out demons, it's the Spirit of God. It's not you. Stop taking the credit for it. Stop thinking you're a, a demon hunter. You're not. But I want you to know you're somebody who invokes the covenant of God and the promises of God. And Jesus wants to establish you according to his word. And he wants you to be obedient to his word so he can get the job done through you. And when you get to that kind of a place, all of a sudden now, here comes the Holy Spirit coming in and going to get the job done. Some people say, well, I just can't pray for anybody because I really don't have that anointing. No, you don't, but the Holy Spirit does. Pray. It's not your job to get people healed. It's your job to what? Be obedient and believe the Word of God. Is anybody listening? So he comes along and he says, the Spirit. Spirit of God, which is so fascinating. Surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Verse 29. And how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless the first bind the strong man? And then you can plunder the house. In other words, you've got to defeat the devil before you can take advantage of what he's done. He who is not with me, now this is really important, verse number 30. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Let me just say it like this. Here's what he's referring to. He that is not with me is walking on a different road than I walk. They may be walking, but they're going that way. And when you go some way other than God... You're not with him, you're against him because your way is not the right way. His way is the right way. And a lot of times what we want to do is we want to walk our way and have God come on and help us where we're at instead of us walking his way. And he says these words, if you are not with me, walking with me, doing what I do, believe in me, going where he goes, does what he does, let me tell you something, then you're against him. It's that simple. It's either black or white. You're either in or out. 
This is not a double road. This is not some big old wide highway. You can do your thing and still stay in there with God. You either follow God or you don't follow God. It's that simple. You're either with him or you're not with him. You can't walk on both sides of the fence with God. Man, that hurts. Crotch shots don't work. Is everybody listening? And you got to get in there and stay on that road where you know where God is at because if you're on some other road, you're not going to make it. And I don't care how close you are to his road. If you're not on his road, you're against him. Because his road is the right road. <laughs> is anybody listening? Yeah. Kind of fun, huh? It gets better. Watch this. Remember, the subject is he empowered his disciples with the Holy Spirit. He's got these, these crazy Pharisees who are all up in themselves and think they're so cool. And, and they're the, the big religious leaders with the big gowns and Oh, all that stuff when in fact they couldn't blow a candle out with their power. They have no power. And here's these guys now calling him something that he's not. Someone who's casting out devils by demons. Now, when you cast out devils by demons and it's really, you say that you cast out devils by demons and what you did is you cast out devils by the Holy Spirit. What you just did is call the Holy Spirit what? A demon. And you got big problems. And for all of us that are in here, he makes a statement that comes up and you got to hear the statement because it's, it's powerful in your growth. Verse number 31. Therefore I say unto you, every sin of blasphemy will be forgiven men. I love that verse. I wish it stopped right there. But, you see the word but up there? You ought to circle it in your Bible and put a big but up there. But means transition in your thinking. In other words, therefore I say to you, every sin of blasphemy will be forgiven, except but. Here's one that won't. The blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. In other words, when you say something is not God when it is, and it might have been by the Holy Spirit that it was God, you're in trouble. So the best thing to say when you don't know if it's the Holy Spirit or not, you want to know what to say? Shut up. Don't say anything. Just be quiet. If it doesn't fit your thinking, doesn't fit your theology, doesn't fit where, who are you and who am I to judge another man's servant? The Bible says in Romans 12, chapter, verse number four, he'll make his servant fall or fail, but he'll cause him to stand. It's God's business, not mine. I cannot come along and criticize someone else where the Holy Spirit's moving and say, man, that is wrong. Guess what? Because when I come against the Holy Spirit, that is unforgivable. In fact, the next verse comes along, verse 32. Again, he says it again. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it'll be forgiven him. In other words, you can say some things, you know, against Jesus. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, then what, what does the Holy Spirit do? He produces the power to work the goodness of God. And the one who produces the power to work the goodness of God, and you're criticizing that? Listen to what happens. It will not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. That's a powerful statement. So when someone comes along and they're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do something and you don't understand it, may I suggest something? If you don't want to get involved, don't get involved, but shut up. That's the wise thing for all of us Christians to do until we find out whether it's God. Because we have the right to judge what's spiritual. If it's not spiritual... We're talking about 1 Corinthians 2, chapter verse 14. If it's not spiritual, I have a right to judge that. I have a right to judge what's, what's spiritual and not spiritual. But until I know, I should shut up in case I'm blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Are you listening to me? Therefore, it stops judging because every time you judge, you'll be judged by the same measure. Matthew 7, chapter. Is anybody listening? And it's so important for us to get these principles because he's empowering his men with the Holy Spirit. I like verse 33. Can I just take you to another verse just real quick? Same thing, just the conclusion of this. Either make the tree good and its fruit good 
or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its... Wait a minute. If I have an ugly, scrawny, little, can't figure it out, weird looking tree and it produces, it doesn't even look like an orange tree, but it produces an orange, it is a what? An orange tree. If it looks like a pine tree, but it produces an apple, it's an apple tree. A tree isn't a tree because of its looks. A tree is defined by what it's produced. And the Bible makes it very clear, you will know them by their, not what they look like, by their fruit. And you and I are fruit inspectors. Find out if there's fruit. We're not here to judge. But man, I want you to know something. I want to know what you're producing to find out what it is. If you're producing garbage. Let me tell you something. You can have a tree produce something. Uh, um, my dad was really into grafting when he was a young man. In fact, in front of mom's house, even today, he's got this, this uh, a grapefruit tree, orange tree, and a lemon tree. It's one tree. This branch puts out this fruit. This branch puts out that fruit. This branch puts out that fruit. It's really, really cool. None of it's any good. <laughs> you can't eat any of it. I mean, the lemon tastes like junk. The grapefruit's junk. The, the orange, it looks like an orange, but taste, ugh, give me a break. It has lemon in it. It just doesn't work good. But he says, either make the tree good. And that's your call, your life because of what you deal and how you deal with the Holy Spirit, or either make the tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You're going to be known in your life with God by what you produce. Tonight, you went through the rain, and you produced something with God. <clears throat> to say as little as that is, that's big with God. Of course, God's worthy enough for all of us to do that. And so the production of fruit comes by the Holy Spirit, what you produce. So let's go back to Matthew 10th chapter. I finished the first verse. <laughs> I'm dreaming. You know what I had? I'm, I have, I, I had, I'm surely I could get you all the way through the 15th verse. <laughs> Anybody having fun besides me? I'm having a ball in the Word tonight. Verses 2, 3, and 4 are kind of fun. He just calls out the name of his disciples. I love that. You know, all the disciples' names. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. What for? Why is that important? In order for you to follow their life, to realize that God uses common men, and when God gets involved with the power of God, they become uncommon men. God uses people just like you that will follow him, listen to his voice, follow his plan, not, a, just not be disruptive to the power of the Holy Spirit, but embrace it and allow it to flow through them. God wants to take common men, common people just like you, and when the power of God comes in, he takes this common person, us, and he makes us an uncommon people to the rest of the world. That's good news. Did you know the only one that was educated and financially stable and came from a really cool, great background of all of his disciples, you want to know which one it was? Judas Iscariot, the one who failed because he was wrapped up too much in himself. The rest were just people like you and I that are going to go after God. Man, that is so cool. Let's see how far we can get in the next few minutes. Verse number five. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter the city of the Samaritans. Verse six. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. A lot of people don't understand that. Why didn't Jesus care about the Gentiles? Why didn't Jesus care about the Samaritans? Why was he only caring about the Jews? Here's why. Listen to the brilliance of God. 
This is so cool. Listen to this. If Jesus had gone to the Gentiles and the Samaritans, the Jews would never have had anything to do with him. Jesus would have been an outcast and the whole entire apple of God's eyes, the Jewish culture, would have been destined for hell forever. But because he went to the Jews first and then his disciples went later on to the Gentiles, they now can open their hearts to Jesus. If he had gone to them first, he would have been thought of as a reprobate. Because they weren't supposed to have anything to do with the Samaritans, anything to do with the Gentiles. Listen to the wisdom here. But God says, I don't want to leave one single group out. That's the love of God. He doesn't want to miss anybody. The brilliance behind this is bizarre. And absolutely mind-boggling how God could care about everybody and make sure that he had to the assignment to reach them all. But in order to reach them all, he had to reach the Jew first because they were separatists. Isn't that fascinating? And that's why he tells his disciples, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans. You go to the lost sheep of Israel. And here they're going to learn. And he goes and he makes this statement in verse number 7. He says, as you go, and I love this word, preach. Go into all the world, the word of God says, into the text. But here he says, go and preach. You might say, well, I don't know what to say. You don't have to say hardly anything. Say something. Do something. Because what you say is anointed by God. Have you ever thought about Moses who couldn't talk? He is stuttering. Why did God use him? Because Moses just had to open up his mouth. God filled it with the right words at the right time, anointed it to do the job. Moses couldn't do it. You can't do it. I can't do it. Nobody in the right mind can get up here and do what needs to get done. Only the power of the Holy Spirit with the people who want to listen and follow and believe. And to obey the things of God. And he says, go, and he says, preach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Whew. But then he starts to make some statements that are pretty wild. This is kind of like crazy in the verse, if you will. Verse number eight. Heal the sick and cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received and freely give. In other words, don't make a business out of the display of the power of God. Oftentimes in church, I just feel it's just crummy that we have to make a business out of it because we have to pay our rent and we have to pay our bills and our mortgage. We have to pay the electrician and we have to pay the electricity and water bill. I mean, I hate the business side of church, but in order for us to gather, in order for us to win souls, in order for us to change lives, in order for us to teach the kids, in order for us to reach the youth, in order for us to be under the bridges and feed the poor, there's got to be a business side to this too. And God allows that. But he says to his disciples, go give. You got it free? Give it out free. And that's the way it all is. Wherever you're at, there's no price for the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way it ought to be. But then he even says something amazing. I'm going to quit with this because I can go all night until you fall over dead. Last one, verse number nine. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staffs. For a worker is worthy of his food. A lot of times, people get angry at ministers that minister the gospel and get paid. As a minister of the gospel, it's always been a subject Debbie and I have always felt uncomfortable about. It's amazing to get paid to serve the Lord. But we don't get paid to serve the Lord. We get paid to pay the bills, like you. A lot of people get angry when preachers receive any kind of money for anything.
But God makes it very clear to his disciples they're not to take any money. They're not to take any clothing other than what they have on. And he says, because you are worthy to be paid. In other words, God was looking for a people that understood the simple principle that if someone brings you something from God, they are worth giving something back to them. It's a simple principle. In fact, it goes on to say in verse number 11, now whatever city that, or town that you enter, inquire who is worthy. If you want to know who's worthy, it's somebody who receives you and hears your words. Who's worthy? And stay there until you go out. And when you go into the household, greet it. In other words, bless it. If the household is worthy, let him your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Whoever will not receive nor hear your words, then you depart from that house and city and shake off the dust. Assuredly, I say unto you that if I will be more, and be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah for the day of judgment than that city. Let me tell you something about God. Last verse. 1 Timothy, the 5th chapter. In 1 Timothy, the 5th chapter, he makes this statement. And the statement is a statement that a lot of people don't understand, especially people who go to church. But here's God's way of doing things and God's plan. In verse number 17 of the fifth chapter, just like he told his disciples, don't take any money, don't take any silver, don't take any gold, don't take any clothing. Look for somebody who's worthy that will hear you, respond to you, and receive you. That's a worthy person. But someone who won't hear you and respond to you is someone who is unworthy and therefore like Sodom and Gomorrah, they will be judged and will be horrible in their life. And let me tell you something, saints of God, you can love God with all of your heart, but if you don't love the way God does things, you're a person that is not walking on the same road with God and you are against God. God wants it a certain way and he makes it clear what he wants. He says, don't go. He says, find a worthy house. They'll take care of you if they hear you and receive you. If they don't take care of you, then they're not worthy and judgment will come on them because they took from you, but they didn't give back to you. Now listen to the word of God in 1 Timothy 5th chapter verse 17. Let the elders who rule well I didn't write this. Be counted worthy of double honor. You see the words double honor? You can search it out all you want. Here's the plan of God. Double honor means twice what somebody else would be paid. Why? Because they rule well. Now watch this. Especially those who labor in the word and the teaching. And then the next verse, verse 18, comes in and it says, For the scripture says, so this is more than one time the scripture is telling us this is the life. You shall not muzzle the ox which treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And just like you're worthy of your wages when you go to work, so is a minister who ministers the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he labors in word and teaching, he's worthy of double. Now, you can say, I don't believe that, but you, you didn't write this. God did. And God uses that as an illustration for his disciples. He says, find a worthy house. If they're not worthy, they will not hear you, receive you, nor take care of you. They're going to have judgment in their life because they took from you, but they didn't bless you back. Because you cannot, listen to this words, you cannot muzzle the ox. Did you know when you muzzle the ox, the ox grinds out the corn, he smells the corn, he knows it's there, but if he doesn't get some of the corn, did you know what an ox does? He stops. And it's the same thing. 
and his disciples went out and he was training them to say, listen, when you do the work of God, God's people are going to take care of you. We've changed this whole thing around in the economy of churches in the world today. In fact, churches are happy, they're celebrating if they don't take up an offering. And that's wrong. Now our church does take up an offering and all of our pastors and people get paid well here because I've known that verse since for 35 or 40 years and I will not break the word of God. So man, let me tell you something. I believe those of you that give are a worthy house that receives the word of God and guess what happens? You will get blessed. I've so totally run out of time and I'm asking for forgiveness, but we covered a lot of subjects. I wanted to get into the angel part. In other words, when you take care of somebody, it's called hospitality in the New Testament. And that everybody should be hospitable. And then it comes in in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse number 2, and it says... Because you don't know who you're entertaining. And it might be an angel. I know that I have entertained some angels. Can I tell you one angel story? And see, when they were coming by, they were saying, let that worthy house know. Listen, then the whole point being is they should have been hospitable to those that were preaching the gospel, but they weren't. And if they were, they got blessed. If they weren't, they weren't. Debbie and I, when we were young, I've told this story before to you, I think one time before, uh, a number of years ago. I don't think Pastor Luke was even born. Debbie and I were just young, and we were up at a meeting in Montana, the Montana wilderness. And I just wanted to go fishing in a wild, obscure mountain lake in Montana that nobody was at, and we found one. Deborah was back with Jessica and some of the other kids, and I went off hiking. And I hiked for two hours, not looking at my time. There wasn't another person on the lake. There wasn't any boating. There was, no, there was not a person in sight. This was a wilderness experience. A, a lake out in the middle of nowhere's land. No roads, dirt roads getting around the lake. I walked for two hours not remembering that night there was a meeting I'm to be at in Montana, in this town of, in Montana. And I, I, I forgot about the time because I came around this big boulder and I looked down and there was this giant pond. And at first I thought, my goodness, it's alligators in the pond. And the water was swishing around. And then as I looked at it, I couldn't believe it. As I went over the rock and looked, it was full of trout. And they were all like this big inside this pond. I got my fishing rod out and I threw in my first cast. My pole hit the ground wall. I caught the biggest trout you ever saw. About that big. <laughs> it was the biggest trout I ever caught, about five pounds. I got it finally to shore. My line was going to break. I finally worked it to shore. I got it in. I took a picture of it. I somehow had a picture of it years ago, but I don't know what I did with that picture. And, and, and I got it up on the shore. And... and and then I realized I had to go back, and it's a two-hour hike back, and the meeting starts in an hour and 15 minutes. What am I going to do? I'm going to miss this meeting tonight. Oh, God, what am I going to do? There's nobody around. I start running back with this big, giant trout. I'm running and running. True story. Listen to this. Across the lake, I see this jet boat coming at me. This thing's flying. The water is flying out of the water. I'm in the wilderness, guys. This is not Colorado River. I'm in the wilderness on top of a mountain. And this, what is that? This boat comes along right up to the shore where I'm at. And the guy says, I said, well, we got to get back. Can you help us get back to the other side of the lake? We're really late. He says, jump in. We jump in the boat. I'm telling you, the boat flew. It had those big engine in the back with a big 
muffler pipes things sticking out. Water was flying everywhere. He was going so fast I couldn't see anything. Water was coming out of my eyes. I was blind from the uh, air. And this guy is all by himself and he's flying across this lake out in the middle of the wilderness in a jet boat with a big engine and a big you know, m motor going up and I'm, I can't see we're going so fast. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this guy's gotta be an angel. Then I looked and he was really grubby looking and he had a crappy t-shirt on and a beer in his hand. And I said, no, he can't be an angel, he's drinking a beer. I don't ever remember him seeing him drink it, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the camouflage, so I didn't know it was an angel. He drops me off right in front of Deborah. Do you remember that, Deborah? Of course you do. Drops me off right in front of Deborah. I get off on the shore, and he buzzes off out of sight and never saw him again. You don't know who comes to your house. You better take care of them. And that's what the word hospitality, and that's when you become worthy. I believe it was an angel. To this day, I'll always believe it was an angel. It was an amazing experience. Tonight, saints, we talked about Jesus. Hopefully God talked to you, shared some things with you. Anybody get anything out of it tonight? <laughs> Praise God. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. Some of you need to give God all of your heart and all of your life and stop messing around with God. Some of you have not been the recipients of the Holy Spirit like you need. Some of you are in this place and God is calling you to himself. He wants to use you, but you've been resisting God because you have your own ideas and your own opinions instead of God's. And if you're not with him, then you're against him, even though you might have mental acknowledgement of him. You may say to yourself, well, I understand that Jesus is the Son of God, and I celebrate his birthday and Easter and all those things and Christmas, but you've never given him all of your heart. You see, even the devil knows who Jesus is. So you having head knowledge about who Jesus is doesn't make you a Christian. Nope, doesn't. Somebody needs to love you, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're going to have to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Bottom line, somebody needs to tell you it's all or nothing. You can't walk, just like I said before, uh, on both sides of the fence. You're going to have to be somebody who, when he calls, you respond, you go, you do. You're a disciple. If you're not ready to do that, you're not saved. And tonight you need to get saved. How do you do that? You give him. you got to give it to him, all of your heart and all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. By giving him all of your heart and all of your life, will get you into the kingdom of God. So listen to this. So you can, like these disciples, follow him. But you, like them, had to get close to him to get instructions. And then he'll get close to you. So tonight is your night to give him all of your heart. Already know you know who he is in your head, but you haven't yet given him all of your heart and you haven't yet given him all of your life. So tonight is your night of salvation. All across this auditorium, in the family rooms, wherever you're at, I tell you what, I want you to think about it. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. I'm going to hit my Bible. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up and I'll see it. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about where you're at, make sure. If you've never given him all of your heart, then get ready to put your hand up. If you've never really given him all of your life, and he's not going to steal it from you, it's your life. He's not a thief. You've got to do this, it's your call. Then get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're saying, well, I'm not sure where I'm at. I prayed with Billy Graham. I prayed at a Harvest Crusade, but, you know, I never followed that up with all my heart and all my life. Well, guess what? Tonight is your night to make a deep commitment for Christ. That's what this is all about. You say, well, Pastor, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be, but it's better to be embarrassed in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what Jesus sees. 
Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. I've done my job. Sit there and do nothing, and he'll do nothing on your behalf. Or get out of your comfort zone. He's calling you home right now, and he's asking you to come to him. Are you going to come? Are you going to say, no, I'm not going to? Remember this, his disciples come when he calls them. And you need to do that. In a moment, get ready to put your hand up, put it right back down. I won't embarrass you, but it's your call, your choice. I'll see your hand, you can put it right back down. All across this auditorium, are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see her. Thank you. God bless you. There's one. Thank you. There's another one back over here. Back here, there's two. God bless you. Got you. All right. Good. Where's the rest of you? Come on. Stop messing with God. There's more than two of you in here tonight. There's three. Come on. Anybody else? Just get your hand up. What is this? Come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Sitting there wondering if you should. You should. There's four. God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? Real quick. There's another one over here. Five. Thank you. There's another one. Six. God bless you. Come on. We're going for Jesus. How could that be bad? Get your hand up. Remember, if you're not with him, you're against him, and you don't want that to be on your card when you come before him. Six, there's seven. Thank you. Anybody else? Got you. You can put your hand down. Anybody else? Seven wise people. Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for seven wise people. Now, here's what I want you to do. All seven of you and anybody that should have raised their hand, but you didn't, you know who you are. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get your stuff. I want all seven of you, listen to the instructions. You raise your hand, you're serious. Get a friend and you can come. Don't sit back doing nothing. Get out of your seat. Get your stuff. Meet me right here in front. Let's stand and welcome them. Anybody else that needs to come, you come too. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I have decided to follow Jesus. Come on, Don't come on. Bring your friend. Don't come on. Thank God you've come. No weird stuff's going to go on. We're just going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You've got to do that. Is that okay? See this guy over here? His name is Pastor Joel. He'll pray with you, give you some free stuff, tell you about a program that'll help you real good. And uh, listen to what he says because he's going to help you. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. Is that okay? You need good things in your life. So make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over that way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.